living happily ever after? Chances are you aren't. In fact, you can't. The story of marriage requires conflict and plot twists and hinges on character development. What's the story of your marriage? How have you and your spouse grown through the ups and downs of marriage? Are you becoming a better person because of your marriage? Hello and welcome to Relationship Helpers. I'm your host, Vincent Ketchy. Today I'm interviewing Dr. Corey Allen. He's a husband, father, author, speaker, marriage and family therapist, and a licensed professional counselor with a PhD in family therapy. He is also the co-host of Sexy Marriage Radio, and he has just authored the new book, Naked Marriage. Uh, Thank you for being with us today, uh, Dr. Allen. Glad to be here. So tell us a little bit more about your background and your expertise. Well, um, background is currently marriage and family therapist, and that's been the case for about 15 years. Um, PhD and all that mess started in 2000, uh, knowing I was heading into this career for the rest of my life. Prior to that was um, some time in the ministry as a youth and family minister, and um, personally been married coming up on 25 years next year. Uh, with two kids, and so I do a pri- I have a private practice here in McKinney, which is a suburb of Dallas, and then also um, have an online site, uh, simplemarriage.net, and then Sexy Marriage Radio, which are both little businesses as well, just trying to help marriages survive, and not just survive, but thrive, and really, really have a passion for wanting marriages to be all they can be, uh, mm. and then some. Mm. So you want to see marriages do well. <laughs> yes, I want I want people to. I mean, I, I've said this before. My goal is to make it the divorce rate zero. Mm. Um, that I think that'd be fantastic. But it's it's the idea of I think most people come into married life uh, without a real accurate view of what it's going to be, and that really messes things up. Mm. So they have these unrealistic expectations of what marriage should be, or what the other partner should give them, or something. Sure. Well, I think I think Hollywood and Hallmark have done a fantastic job of <laughs> skewing what married life is um, because it's not happily ever after. Mm. <laughs> you know, it's okay, it's yeah. not just it's not just that. It's not love. It's not joy. It's not uh, sex in the morning with the breeze blowing through the windows and the birds chirping. And you know, <laughs> it's, 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 it's it's fighting over socks and toothpaste and <laughs> schedules and, you know, all of that. It, so it's just, I think a lot of times if we can help people see uh, a little bit of a different lens to view what goes on in marriage, it changes dramatically what we do. Mm, so a lot of people go in it with this mindset that it's just going to be happily ever after and everything's going to be easy once they get married and that that partner's going to meet all their needs and that's just not the case. Yeah, I think that you know we get that that develops in in dating, right? Where we right. have that idealized distortion of each other, and it's the obsessed, chemically induced high in our brain <laughs> that goes on in new in new love, and it, it allows us to not see everything clearly because we're also not portraying everything clearly. I mean, that's the joking way I talk about that is that. Um, you know, when we meet and fall in love with somebody, we're actually meeting their marketing departments. Right. You know, yes. They, <laughs> that they they do a good job of kind of portraying the best of them, quote unquote, while yes. I'm doing the same. Yeah. So it's your best acting, I guess. So if they're really right. good actors, they can really seem great. <laughs> yeah, and it's not usually too far of a skew. Okay. You know, because we can't we can't flat out lie right. uh, most of the time and keep it straight of what we're saying. But it is it is a skew still. It is a it's not the full story. It's not it's not the full picture, and that's what comes out when we're married because you can't hide from people you live with. Mm. I mean, you just know it. We read each other too well. So you're spending time with each other so much, you just have to be yourself at times. You can't always be on, I guess. Well, absolutely no. There's no possible way you could. You couldn't have the emotional energy or the mental energy. To, to always be on like you were when you were dating. Plus, you don't have the um, the the spike of obsess- obsession towards each other to keep it going, mm-hmm. right? You don't have so, those hormones or whatever is going right. through us. Yes. So it's it's that idea of you know if you've been if you if you're with anybody for any length of time, you, you pretty well read the landscape pretty well, 
and and are and are, and are usually pretty accurate. So, so we've got listeners out here that maybe are thinking about getting married. They've been dating for a while. How long do you think a, a person should maybe date before they get married, or how? <laughs> well, uh, there's no clear answer for that one in my book. Um, okay. One thought would be is if you are in the dating world um, and you and you think you've got the person that would make the most sense to be with, um, one of the best counsels I've heard and give is date for quite a while and put yourself in a lot of stressful situations together because stress uh, re- removes the the barriers of how we really are. Okay. <laughs> you know, All right. <laughs> it, when I'm, when I, you know, travel together, go to deal with TSA um, <laughs> together, you know, okay. some of those things that are normal <laughs> dealing with life and struggles and, and watch how people respond to each other and to others. Uh, that gives you a little indication of character and who they are. Um, but you know, that's one of Dr. Schnarch's phrases, which I love. He's the theorist I kind of follow. Um, he, he makes the comment of nothing prepares you for marriage, but marriage. Okay. You know, because there is aspects of the relationship you're not going to understand until you're in it. And so some of it comes down to waiting the right amount of time. What is that? You know, it's, if, if you've met somebody and they make sense to you and the way they process life and deal with life, then you're probably going to be okay in the sense of, all right, we're, we, can, we can survive. <laughs> we can, this makes sense. It doesn't mean the work's done. Right. I think that's when work really just begins. Yeah, you're saying those stressful situations seem to really help a person get clarity on, on where yeah. the relationship really is at. Yeah, I mean, if you're in a, an issue, you know, the one that comes to my mind is travel because my wife has bought in hook, line, and sinker, the idea that we're supposed to be there two hours early okay. to every plane. And I want to be the last one on the plane okay. because I don't, I don't want to sit on the thing any longer than I have to just because it's just not comfortable and I'm tall enough that my legs, you know, there's not enough leg room. And so that's usually a barrier for us and a struggle that we can turn personal at times. Mm-hmm. Because she's just more comfortable knowing we've made it on time, whereas I'm a little more comfortable trying to see if we can almost miss the plane, you know? <laughs> right, so, right, yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> Two different it, strategies. <laughs> absolutely, and neither one are right or wrong, although mine is. Um, <laughs> it's the joke. Uh, but it's just seeing it as, okay, so that brings that stuff out. That brings anxieties out in both of us. And how do we, do, how do we handle those? Mm-hmm. And that, that's, that's good information to know. That's good data because that's the kind of stuff that rears its head in married life. That's for sure the kind of stuff that rears its head in sex too. So it's just seeing this through the lens of, okay, what's going on and who am I with and how well do they handle themselves versus want someone else to handle them. That's the kind of stuff that married life is all about. That's the drive wheel of it to me. Yeah, so seeing if someone reacts to you or how they do re- react or if they're just common situations or, yeah. or or how you both handle it together. Yeah, yeah, because that's the stuff that, I mean, I, I believe at its core, marriage is designed just to help us grow up. Um, the psychobabble term for it is differentiation, uh, but I think of it in the terms of just developing maturity, developing wisdom, <laughs> developing depth. <laughs> The second closest relationship that does that is parenting because um, mm. our kids challenge us to do that and to, to grow up and deal with life differently because we are different people pre-kids versus post-kids just because of them and, and what they challenge us and, and demand of us. Well, married life is the same way in my book. It, it really does challenge us to stand on our own two feet to learn how to give, to be compassionate, to show love, to serve with no strings attached. I mean, all of that kind of stuff is perfectly played out in married life. We don't always play it perfectly, but it's designed for that. Mm, so each one's a step up of us maturing if we handle it correctly or if we're actually working on maturing. Well, I think, yeah, I think it's all of this is just a process of growing. That it's That's what I think of it is because... I mean, let me. Okay, so you've been married for how long, Vince? Wow, that's a good question. Uh, Twelve years. <laughs> okay, so are you a better husband now than you were two years in? I surely hope so. <laughs> so sure. yeah, yeah, I've learned a lot. So and my wife's taught yeah. me a lot of things that I probably wouldn't have listened to. Say one of my friends tell me. 
Yep. And so that's the whole point is experience is what teaches us that. It, it's, it's having to go through it. It's the same thing when we were kids and our parents would tell us, you know, don't go do that. Don't go do that. Don't go do that. And then we finally go do it and realize, yeah, they were right. I shouldn't go do that. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it, so some of the things we're, we're slow learners as humans. And so we experience is what teaches it the best. And hopefully the price is just not too high. Mm. But it is realizing that, yeah, okay, so what if I was to see, and this is where I've gotten so much uh, traction, I guess, with the work I do uh, with Sexy Marriage Radio and the message that it is, that what if I was to look at the problems that I have in married life through a different lens, Mm. that it actually is intended to happen, you know, that conflict is supposed to be there, Mm. that we're supposed to struggle over sex. Right. is it is it erotic enough or it frequent enough or quality enough? You know, mm-hmm. those are things that are supposed to happen. And if and if you can change that premise with couples from thinking, well, something's going wrong versus no, that's actually what it's supposed to do, you just dramatically empowered both people to look at it and do something different. So you're helping people see these uh, obstacles in sex or in other areas of their marriage as actually opportunities to improve their marriage. That's the hope, um, and it, it maybe well, and I think it, that's almost jumping the gun. That mm-hmm. it's it's first step is to improve myself. Oh, uh, okay, individually, yes, that, learn that, more about that. Yourself. The idea of the relationship is working more on me than I ever could on it, and so if I will look at it through that lens of what is this revealing about me mm. that maybe I need to grow up in, or that's not even born yet in a capacity that I could have, and. Some of those things to where you realize, okay, hold on, that makes me more like who I, I like who I am more if I if I do that, and that's mm. almost a a divine kind of a thing happening that is truly powerful, and and it makes us. I mean, marriage done right produces good people. You know, it just it, it makes the, the people are just good. They're just better. Yeah, so they're more whole, I guess. Yeah. Marriage at its finest is two fully functioning humans together, mm-hmm. not one carrying the weight of the other. Yeah, I think for myself, uh, one thing that I learned, I don't know about you, but for myself, I learned from my wife was that maybe sometimes, and I never really thought of this that way so much, that maybe now as a counselor looking at it, maybe that I was kind of aggressive at times or maybe too abrasive to people with with how I worded things or how my tone how about yourself were there some areas maybe that you realized with you that you didn't know as a single person but you realized later on well I think that my, my best example would be just from who I was early in my marriage versus who I am now uh, I was I was skewed in um, the world of Corey pretty well as a younger guy that it was truly I didn't want to grow up I wanted to be a perpetual teenager. Um, you know, it's just I, I didn't. I was refusing a lot of different things because it's just that's no fun. That takes away the joy of life. I want to spend money even if I don't have it. Debt's fine. All that kind of mess that you, you know, if you're not taught that growing up, you got to learn it. Life's going to teach it to you. Mm, so you didn't want responsibilities. Yeah, but I wanted the joy and the accolades that came with responsibilities. Okay, all right. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> you want all the good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It's like I wanted sex without having to put the work in to make it happen, right? Right. Uh, because I said I do, she said I do, so that means let's do it, right? Right, and right. No, it doesn't work that way. So it's seeing it through the lens that now life on life terms teaches that stuff mm-hmm. of I'm, I am now, you know, it's not demanded – but life almost demands it that I have to I have to create stuff that is me being engaged in it and I have choices over that, all of it. Of if there's a situation that I have a, that I wanna do or I don't want to do and I choose to do it, I can't hold somebody else hostage because I chose that, right? That you have to take responsibility for those decisions. Yeah, that's that whole proverbial if my wife invites me to the Chris her office Christmas party, you know, and that's one of those the spouses office Christmas parties usually aren't the most enjoyable because you don't know the people. Right, right. And but it, So if I go and I'm miserable, I usually blame her. The worst in me will, at least. But in reality, no, I chose to come. So how do I f- approach this differently because of that? That, to me, is a huge difference. Yeah, so how do you embrace that decision and actually make the best out of it? 
Yeah, and own it. Yeah, just own the consequences of my own choices because I think everything in life is choice. Hmm. So everybody has the choice to have a, a good marriage or at least a healthy marriage or uh, healthier relationships if, if they desire. Well, everybody has a choice to do the work or not. <laughs> Let's go that okay. route. All right. <laughs> um, whether we choose it, yeah, sometimes what wisdom is, I'm not going to address this right now because it is too much of an issue. And But then there's other times where it's like, you know what, this has been festering long enough. I've got to start examining what is it that I'm creating with this that it's not just my spouse's fault. It's we co-create it because either – I don't speak up about what I really want or I allow something that's intolerable. You know, there's lots of different things. That that's my role in it, even though I could play the card of it's not my fault. Well, if you allow it to keep going, it is. Mm. So you're seeing a and, lot of passive spouses. Well, I think I see a lot of passive humans. Okay. All right. Because it's a whole lot easier if we just let other people do stuff for us mm. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> rather than realizing no life demands that I have to uh, be the master of my own fate you know to a degree that I have to live my own life and speak up for the things I'm interested in mm. whether I get them or not is a whole different story but most of the time I think we don't even speak up for them mm. we're not speaking up we're not trying to 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 make that decision, or even try to plan our life, or even try to take ownership. right. Well, like, yeah, we, we do it covertly, maybe. You know, it's, let, let's go the the typical. So you have the higher desire partner for sex in a marriage or a relationship, and they're sending signals that they're interested in having some sex, but they don't come straight out and say it or make it overt about those signals. They try to be covert about it because. If I'm covert and that's rejected, it's less of a rejection than if I was to say, hey, baby, I'm really interested in having some sex with you tonight. She says, no, that hurts. That hurts differently. And so we have, as humans, a huge fear of rejection. Yes. Yes. So <laughs> we all want to be accepted and get a trophy. <laughs> yeah. Or so we don't want to fail. Yeah. <laughs> right. So if I was to look at this as, okay, how do I be more overt about my life? How do I speak up more about my interests, knowing whether or not I get it is a completely different component. The point is, do I start leaning into my own world more? Do I start kind of shifting things as I want them more? And then I adjust when I get pushback, when I hear, I mean, that's a respectful thing. We do that with neighbors a lot more than we do with a spouse. Mm. So we're a lot more proactive with neighbors than many times we are with our spouse. Well, there's, there's less risk with them because we don't have the higher hierarchy of importance on the relationship. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're not living with them. <laughs> well, and we're also probably not having sex with them, hopefully. So <laughs> yeah, hopefully so. <laughs> that's, that's one of those that does ruin a relationship. But it is, it's, it's realizing, you know, the person I have sex with, it, it, it complicates the, the matter. That's just the truth of my book, in my book. But it, because there is an element of that it's almost diminishing that I used to have this vic fall victim to this, that if I had the fear that if I made my wife mad, I could kiss sex goodbye. Ah. And then I started realizing, hold on, there's going to be some things that make her mad about life or about me or about a choice. But that doesn't mean she's not still a sexual being hmm. and interested in that. So why don't I let her do her job <laughs> and I'll do mine? You know, and and that's where it gets convoluted, where we start to think we can control both sides of the equation in marriage rather than seeing it as I'm just responsible for my side. Instead of kind of trying to manipulate the other person into having sex or manipulating them to get whatever you want. Absolutely. Or... But it's the whole it's the whole idea of all I can do is present something I think that's worth being in a relationship with. Mm -hmm. And that's that's my job. I mm -hmm. can't convince them otherwise. Mm -hmm. So you can just be so. genuine with them. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the process of growing up right there. That's the evolution of us and the redefining of us and the the smoothing of our rough edges. I think that's what relationships do. Mm -hmm. So the relationships help us to be more open, maybe more honest with, with I guess, maybe each other, but Every, also... With... Everyone and ourselves. Mm. Because how often are we not honest with ourselves at times, too? You know, there's aren't there, aren't there times where I convince myself something that's not true? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and I'm basically fooling myself, and I know it, but I still do it. Well, 
Life on Life Terms has a really sophisticated way to take care of that if I'll look at it. Mm. So many times we're, uh, we just lie to ourselves and make ourselves feel better. It can be, absolutely. You've been counseling for, for a long time with couples, and are there some trends, or what trends have you seen over the last few years that you've seen uh, in your couples? I don't know if there's any new trends. Um, the main thing that I see um, with the work I do with in, in my practice is a lot of couples come in thinking they have trouble communicating, which I dispel that one really quickly because I think everything we do communicates, so... It, the fact that they're mad at each other means they communicate just fine. Okay. Um, because typically you cannot not communicate in a committed relationship because everything you say and everything you don't say communicates. So it comes down to handling the messages better. Um, but as far as my practice, um, I get I get some really crisis level cu- couples. That's that's a lot of what I get is couples that are either on the verge of filing the paperwork for divorce or they've already filed it and they want to come back in for one last chance um, or just to be sure uh, you know, it's not salvageable. Right, so it's a last-ditch effort. Yeah, or um, affairs are an issue that, 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 you know, that, that comes out. Um, and then the other is just I, I get quite a few couples that – and they're usually all kind of interwoven as far as these topics because they all feed off each other. Right. But then the other is just sex issues, you know, just difficulties with their sex life that mm. one or both of them have just reached the point of we got to deal with this because this is causing enough problems that I'm willing to leave. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so they're, they're – so, it's became that bad where they're angry about it and they've not worked on it. And Yeah, well, you know full well being a therapist yourself that um, – you know, people don't reach out for issues until there's enough pain. Mm. <laughs> so, yeah, they don't come uh, until the crisis usually. Right. We don't. We don't typically, and this is a downfall of us as humans. I think we don't typically pay for help when we don't really need it, knowing if it would be cheaper if I would do it that way. Right. right. <laughs> if yes, I would, it would save a lot if, if I would just maintenance. <laughs> yeah, if I would invest in some enrichment things with my marriage, on con- uh, ongoing. I'll save money <laughs> right, in the yes. long run. <laughs> so, but it's just that whole, if it's going okay, why do I, you know, I, I get it. I, I struggle with it too. On it's, if I'm comfortable, why rock the boat? You know, yeah, and they, they don't see a need for it. Right. So it, it just, it's that struggle of just starting to see it as, okay, most people, I mean, I, current research, well, last time I came across this was several years ago, but current research at that point was showing most couples didn't reach out for marriage uh, therapy until six years after the problem was noted as a problem. Mm. You know, where it was actually brought to the couple's communication level, and then six years later they finally reach out on average for help. So there's a lot of procrastination. It sounds like uh, there's a lot of sadism and okay. masochism. Actually. Okay. <laughs> We just kind of beat each other up, hoping that it'll change, um, <laughs> okay. or we could tolerate the pain, and we're gluttons for punishment. Um, <laughs> okay. So right. I don't think it's necessarily procrastination because there's an element of I don't want to admit there's a problem, oh, right? Okay. I don't, I don't want, I don't want to have to tell somebody else. Oh. No one else needs to know my business. Mm-hmm. You know, all that kind of mess. And that's where the beautiful thing is, like Sexy Marriage Radio, and then I'm, I'm, I'm extrapolating that your show and some of those things. It, the more we can get out there that normalizes issues in marriage and that there are that they exist and mm-hmm. that they serve a purpose, the more likely people will confront them differently and then maybe reach out for help before it becomes too late. Right. So they may actually talk to others about their problems yeah. in their marriage instead yeah. of trying to handle it all on their own. Yet you were saying like for six years, maybe they're just trying to handle it on their own the best they know how, feeling like they can fix it. Or Tell me, tell me if you agree with this, Vincent, that um, there's probably a belief. Actually, I think there is this belief that if I, I, we can communicate our way through this, we can come up with a way to solve this by talking more about it, right? Right, <laughs> right. Because obviously – if you will just understand where I'm coming from with this, that will make the problem go away. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's just not the case. No, because you they know, keep that's, that's, seeing it from the, the same point of view and it's not changing. 
they're not understanding right. it in a deeper level. Right. Yeah, it, it's that idea of if just because I understand where you're coming from doesn't mean I agree with where you're coming from. Right. So they just end up being stuck there. <laughs> yeah, and that's that's the whole gridlock concept of married life that that there's every couple has gridlock issues, which is where what you want is blocked by what your partner wants. So how do you help people to get beyond that gridlock? You start trying to get them to examine more and more of what that gridlock is demanding of themselves, not each other. Mm, so you look at yourself individually. Yep, and that's the paradox of, of the work I believe in, that I work on myself to help my marriage, not my marriage to help myself. Mm. So it's a very much more... Uh... God-centered approach, or at least uh, not uh, self-centered, I guess, as much. Yeah, it's well, it's it's the idea of of seeing it through the lens of what is this, what is this teaching me? Um, how could I be better? Um, but it's also not exclusive of the relationship. It's not for the sake of me just being better by itself. It's me being better within the context of the relationship. Mm -hmm. So it's really a desire to be more, uh, more maybe more godly or healthier, just in ourselves. Sure. Yeah. I think. And, and yeah, it's to create. I mean, be, having more character, having more wisdom, uh, being more Christ-like, all of that kind of stuff works. Growing up, all of. I mean, all of those, whatever kind of label you want to put that fits with the value structure you live according to. Mm -hmm. I think that's kind of what life is requiring of us. Mm. So tell me about what uh, what was maybe your aha or light bulb moment, kind of a, a time when you know you just kind of got it, I guess, within your counseling practice. Well, that would have been in grad school when I was introduced to Dr. Schnarch's work, because um, okay. you know in school in my doc program you get introduced to all the different theories that are the major works, and you go through and you have to learn them all fairly well to start trying to figure out which one resonates most with you, which one makes the most sense, right? So um, in my doc program, it was the second second year, for, no, it might have been my second semester, that is when we read Passionate Marriage and the uh, Constructing the Sexual Crucible, which are his two uh, major works at the time. And just reading it, it just made sense. It just clicked. It was like, okay, this just makes sense to me. And he, he took Bowen's work, which is a family theorist, and applied it specifically to a marriage process where he starts to see that there's a drive force that we have in human nature of wanting to grow up, of, of wanting to be better, of, of wanting to connect but still be our own person. And, and that's the whole concept of differentiation. So as I was reading it, it just was like, okay, this makes complete sense to me, and I can see it's biblical in my mind and the way I look at it, because Schnarch is not a Christian, in the way he writes or, or teaches, he's, he's probably, um, I don't even know where he's coming from. I think he acknowledges a divine, but that's all I've ever heard him do. But it's still applicable, and, and I, see, I see a biblical uh, symmetry with this in the sense that God cares more about our character than he does about our happiness. I think that, hello marriage, <laughs> right? Because character, character development's going on a whole lot more than happiness. I think we become better people and better Christians in relationship. You know, you can't be a Christian uh, alone, and that's taking a spiritual context out of it. That it's within people that we that we've uh, are better. So, what better way to help people create wisdom and character than put them in a relationship with someone that they love and drives them crazy? Well, we're coming down to um, to the end, uh, but tell us about your current passion now. Um. Well, I think it's largely just kind of doing what, what's been going on, just kind of keeping it going and trying to keep spreading the message um, of that there's something deeper going on with marriage and there's something deeper going on with sex because it seems to resonate with everybody that hears it. And so I want more people to hear it. And so uh, I, I spend a lot of energy right now on Sexy Marriage Radio and growing its audience and making sure that that content is is the absolute best it can be, and then still see clients, but it, it's kind of a it's not a juggling act. It's more of a harmony act of you know just trying to make sure I can keep life simple enough to still do it all and and enjoy it with my family.
if you look at it, sex is really just a language that it, it, it teaches us a lot. It's not just an act. It's more than that. So even if I look at my sex life through a different lens of what's this teaching me, what am I seeking in it? How could I be better in it? You know, that kind of stuff. That's all good stuff that's empowering to people. What has been your biggest stumbling block? Um, my own uh, desires to want to take the easy way out of things sometimes. <laughs> Just being lazy. What's your advice for our listeners? It's probably something along the lines of um, I'm, I'm not the center of the universe, nor should I ever try to be. <laughs> that, that I'm not as that I'm not as important as I think I am, you know. Just to to be 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 humble, kind of an idea. And my my wife is very good at that, <laughs> reminding me that. What's your favorite book? Um. Well, one of the ones from early on, not early on, but recent, it, Donald Miller's work. Um, Blue Like Jazz was probably one of the huge ones on just looking at Christianity through a different lens. His second one after that with A Million Miles in a Thousand Years is really good um, just to help. That helped me frame a lot of things on under the whole auspices of a story. And that I like that. I, I, I come back to that a lot. That's good. So we're here at the end. Share with us some parting wisdom and the best way to contact you. Um, the parting wisdom would be to do what you can to look at what's going on between you and other people through a different lens um, that, and use that to hopefully then ask, what is this that's being demanded of me? Um, what is this that's trying to teach me? Uh, something to that effect where I start to empower my own side because in relationships we can get so caught up in the blame game. I can't believe you did this and you did that. And if you wouldn't have done that, then this wouldn't have, you know, and start looking at, okay, wait, what's my role in all of this? Uh, and then the easiest way to reach me, my online world is simplemarriage.net. Um, that gets you to everything I've written, um, a way to get a book if you want to buy one. Uh, you can also get them on Amazon, iBooks, that kind of stuff. But, and then that also gets you to Sexy Marriage Radio. They're all under the same umbrella. So simplemarriage.net, and I'm pretty easy to find. Well, thank you for being with us here today. Yeah, this has been fun. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for joining us today on Relationship Helpers. It is our hope that you gain some valuable information. For the show notes and more information on today's topic, please visit www.relationshiphelpers.net. Again, that is www.relationshiphelpers.net. If you enjoyed our show, please go to iTunes to subscribe, rate, and review. If you had questions or concerns about our show, please let us know about this as well by going to our website, www.relationshiphelpers.net. Thanks again and have a blessed week. Note that accuracy and authority in regards to the subject matter covered today is not a replacement for professional care. Neither the host, the clinicians, or the guests are rendering clinical or other professional advice. Seek professional help if you need it. Oh,